I've never been a shallow person. I've always wanted to know more than what was on the surface. I've always been that way. Most people are happy just knowing that the clear liquid that we drink, that call water, that it's just water. But I've always wanted to know the chemical makeup of it, H2O. That's the way I've been. So the same thing holds true for me with God and his people. I've always wanted to know what he does, why he does it. And there were many times I just thought he wasn't unfair. He wasn't fair. Anybody in the house thought that? I can remember being distinctly angry at God as he took me through the wilderness. I thought it was unnecessary. I didn't know why it, that I had to go that way. Some of you have maybe have been in the same position. I'm an intelligent person. Just tell me which way to go, which way to turn, and I can get it. So for those of you that may have felt that way, I've chosen to share with you this morning God's purpose for our wilderness. Say it with me. God's purpose for our wilderness. I know that some of you may have heard these messages before about the wilderness experiences of Moses and the Israelites, but I believe it bears repeating because some of you are going through your own personal wilderness right now. Others of you have been through several wildernesses in your life's journey and still may not fully understand why. And some of you have yet to go through a wilderness experience that will reveal your true heart. And I believe today's sermon will help you understand God's purpose for the wilderness experience. As Jasmine was up talking, I touched Pastor Jackie. I said, oh, there she goes. She's in my message. You may think, that it's completely unnecessary and ask questions like, why must we have wilderness experiences? Are wilderness experiences even necessary? Are wilderness experiences the same for each of us? Or how long, God, must I go through the things that I'm going through? Answer to question number one. If you're worth your weight in gold and belong to God, you must have a wilderness experience. God has a purpose for it. Answer to question number two. Our wilderness experiences do differ and are customized by God based on us as individuals and God's plan for us. Answer number three. You will go through the wilderness as long as you need to until you learn the lesson that God is trying to teach you. The wilderness experience, it preaches well. You know, we can get up here and we can go at it and we can preach. But it's understood in a different light when you live through it. The definition of a wilderness, and this is straight from the dictionary, is an uncultivated, uninhibited, inhospitable place or region. It's a place in the wild where wild animals live. There is no civilization as we know it. It's a place where the civilities of life that we're accustomed to, like water, food, electricity, do not exist. This was the case with the Israelites when they made the exodus from Egypt. Egypt had cisterns, large buildings, food, and what they needed to make them comfortable. Things got so bad for the Israelites while in the wilderness that they wanted to go back to Egypt, a place of comfort, a place of familiarity, even though they were in bondage. Does that sound like some people you know? Does it sound like you may have been in that place before? Things have gotten so bad you've been freed and God has come into your life and he saved you and many of you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, but he took you through a wilderness place. And you begin to ask, Lord, why? I wish I had stayed in Egypt. There had been times that you just wanted to go back and say it was better in the world. At least I had somebody taking care of me. At least I had food to eat. At least I had what I wanted. Amen.
in order to equip us as warriors, to purge us from our old ways, to learn to trust God, the wilderness is this place where God calls us to experience him. At some point in your life, every one of us will have a wilderness place. Those things that make us feel secure and comfortable are out of reach. Our world as we know it is shaken. It seems like we're turning in circles because the wilderness test is one of those tests that tests us to our very core. Have any of you ever been there? I can remember I was marching along in God and he was using me in miracles as he does today. And things were going well and some of us began to feel entitled. And then we've been told by the saints that everything's going to be all right. But many have not told us about our wilderness experience. How many of you have had a wilderness experience? Let me see your hands. Put those down. How many of you are in the wilderness now? Oh, I need to know that. How many of you say, I don't know what you're talking about. Things are good for me. May I see your hands? Oh, there's nobody in the house like that. <laughs> Glory to God. It's a place of lack, a place where what makes us comfortable and secure does not exist. Every true believer will and must have this wilderness test at least once in your lifetime. And for those that are called to the elite forces and those that are called to leadership, you will experience wilderness experiences more than once in this Christian walk. But why? You remember I asked the questions, why must we go through that, God? Why is it necessary? This place of hardship with seemingly no ease, no rescue, and it goes on and on, where everything we previously knew or thought we knew and that we've been taught about God and ourselves and others seems to be of no use. Have you ever been in that place? I've been in a place where I thought I knew God, in a place where I thought I knew more than I know that I don't know now, if that makes any sense. And God turned my world upside down, and I thought it was so unnecessary. Why? It doesn't make sense to me, God. This wilderness is a place where nothing we have learned seems to apply. It's wild. I'm out there, just like the children of the Israelites. No food, no drink. Moses had to hit the rock because they had no water. They ran out of food. He had to rain down manna from heaven. God wants to prove himself in the wilderness. Many times we think that we're sufficient. And that we have it together. But only as we continue to walk with God and trust him in the wilderness. Say trust him in the wilderness. Well, things later make sense. The wilderness is a place of separation. It's a place where God shows up to let us know that he's the one that's all powerful, all knowing. And can totally provide for us when we cannot provide for ourselves. It's a place that strips us of our pride and our self-sufficiency. It's a place of transformation into the image of his dear son. It's a place that empties us of self and prepares us to be filled with God and God's ways. But many don't pass the tests in the wilderness. We begin to grumble and complain and feel like God has forsaken us and many people walk away and they begin to establish their own ways. Have you seen it in the church? Amen. That people are just going through the motions and they say it's too much. They want relief. So they build idols. They get drunk and they use sexual immorality to ease their pain. They just want to feel better rather than to allow God to prepare them for a better future. If you've not been in that place, may or you may not, but you've seen others. 
So let's read right now in the New Testament what Paul says about those in the wilderness who refused to trust God, but they grumbled and they turned to their own ways. God is saying to us, we don't want to be like that. Just hit yourself. Say, I don't want to be like some of the Israelites. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 11. We want to avoid Israel's mistakes. We don't want to be like that. But we are tempted. Amen. And sometimes we want to walk away. Sometimes we get tired. Sometimes we uh, get despaired about it. So when you have it, say amen. All right. And it reads, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. And they all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. For their dead bodies were spread out in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they indeed craved them. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Nor are we to commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor are we to put the Lord to the test, as some of them did, and were killed by the snakes." nor grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroyer. Nor these things, now these things happen to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages are to come. Say amen. This is a warning to us as Christians today because people are turning after their own way. I was listening just the other day at two gay pastors who are married to gay men. And they have their own doctrine, their own way, and their own reasons for what they're doing. We must be prepared for such things with the word of God. Amen? When things don't go the way we want and we lust after what we want, we will come up with ways to excuse it using scripture. And God said that, and I've said this many times, that God is taking us through the wilderness because he's trying to prepare you for the world. It's a beast. We have to be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us. We can no longer just sit on the sidelines and just say that things are going to happen and God's going to take care of it. We have to be ready to fight. God has to take us through the wilderness and allow us to lack so that we can gain spiritual muscles. We have to be ready to resist the enemy because the spirits in the world are mind-bending. I'm looking at the churches. They are growing by the thousands, and the people are full of sin. This church in Dallas, we were listening to it, and I'll call his name, Pastor Will Horn. My daughter went to school with him, and it's growing by the thousands because of his intellect. Intellect can fool you. Just because I sound intelligent, I have the right words, does not mean that you know the true and living God. But we are deceived if we don't seek him for ourselves. That's why it behooves us to study the word of God and be filled with his spirit. And that's why I love this church, Pastor Jackie, because there is so much prayer. But I look at the deception. I'm looking at the transgender, and I'm looking at our children in school, how they're being pressed. But you know what frightens me most? It's in the church. It's in the church. And people are hiding in our services. There was another young lady, she got on, the, on there, and she said, I love God so much. And she's gay, and she's married to someone else, to another woman. And she says, I love God, but I feel shame when I go to church. And I don't know how many of you that listened to Jackie Perry Hill. She was a lesbian, and she's the God has changed her life. And we have the testimony of our own son who had a gay lifestyle. 
And that's why we stand tall and, and declare the word of God and share our own experiences how God is able to deliver. He was seduced in the church by someone on the organ in the church, say in the church. So you think you're bringing your people to a safe house, and that's why you have watchmen on the wall. You should thank God for people like Pastors Jerry and Jackie Martin. They have a life that they're living before you, say amen. But say in the church. How pastors are seducing their flock in the church. And that's why the word of God is say he was not well pleased with many. And everybody did not make it. Just because you're sitting in the pew does not mean that you will necessarily make it. We have to live the word of God. And that's why I love this ministry because they're preaching and teaching the word of God. They're not entertaining you. The worship is pure. They're preaching and teaching the word of God. So I often come and take the opportunity to warn the people of God. Don't resist your wilderness. Pass the wilderness test. If you're worth your weight in gold, you're going to stand. You're going to stand the test as God makes you. I remember saying, uh, when things are going well, you know, we can really believe God. And I thought he had forsaken me, and I was so disheartened. Honey knows, and I cried out because I didn't understand. And I said, where are you, God? But when he finished with me, all the muscles, all the strength, there's not much that I cannot deal with. When the enemy sees me, he tucks tail and run. Praise the Lord. And that should be the case for you because God is trying to build you, uh, trying to build warriors. He doesn't want wimps. Say amen. Now we're going to read the reasons God allowed the children of Israel to wander the wilderness for 40 years. Say 40 years. Do you know that they could have made it there in two weeks? In 11 days or more, they could have made it, but they wandered 40 years. You may be wondering why you're going through the same thing over and over and over again. Maybe it's because you're not getting it. Maybe it's because God wants to break you and make you another vessel. Maybe it's because of the pride. Maybe it's because when he does bless you, and that's what I like about him. He's get, like about God. He's getting us ready for our blessings. Because you know how it is with us. When things go well, you know, we act a certain way. We get off to diddy. We don't understand other people when they go through. We forget where God has brought us from. So he allows us to be imprinted. Say imprinted. He said, oh, I'm going to keep you going, Joyce. I'm going to put this on your brain. Because I was one that was self-sufficient. I was one of those that made the straight A's. I was one of those that things went well. And he said, I got to bring you down a notch, girl. I didn't know I thought like that. I didn't know I was self-sufficient. He said, I got to take you through the wilderness. Amen. And so he hit me. And, I, and I've shared with you, many of you, the testimonies that I've gone through. And I say to you often, everywhere I go, and everywhere I preach, God will always touch the thing that you love. Because he refused to have anybody on the heart of your throne other than himself. And it's a great sacrifice for those of you that love God. How many of you love God? Amen. You say you do, but wait till the test comes. <laughs> there are times that you want to take back your yes. <laughs> there are times that you want to say, I don't think so. And I can remember I said, yes, Lord, when you're beginning with God, you said, I love you, Lord. Yes, anything you say. And that stuff starts hitting you, and you say, I take it back. And God said, no, I remember when you meant it. Amen. All right, we're going to close with this scripture, remembering the Lord your God. Let's go to Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter, and I hope I'm blessing somebody. Amen. Not going to be before you long, and we're going to pray for you and let you go watch your football game. Praise the Lord. When you have it, say amen. The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. He was talking to the Israelites but we can look at that today. God has given us many precious promises. He says, but I'm preparing you. 
You got to be prepared before you can go in. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. I want to put a pause there for just a minute. Many of us don't know our own hearts. We don't know what will tempt us. We think we know ourselves. So God allows us to stay in a place until we can see our true hearts. And also to humble us. I had no idea. I was proud. I thought I was a good girl. Amen. But he began to show me the th hidden things of the heart. And he calls me to suffer such loss. Amen. Many times loss are the things that bring you to your knees. Amen. But he's preparing you so that when you move into this place of blessing, I had no idea it would get that good. I had no idea that I could stand the things that I can stand now. I had no idea that he would just bless me and bless me. But the weight of his glory has not caused me to be puffed up. Why? Because those are those triggers in my mind. He said, watch it, girl. You remember? Check yourself, and he'll remind me of when he put his hands on me and when he made me, when he broke me. And there are times, amen, and we don't realize our flesh is a mess. Our flesh is a mess. And it will strut when it, you don't even know it's strutting. And I remember I was walking around the house, and the Lord said, do you remember when nobody knew your name? <laughs> do you remember, girl? And I said, why are you telling me this? He said, because your heart is becoming puffed up. So God allows things to happen over and over in the wilderness so he can trigger in your brain and remind you, hey, I'm checking you. Does that make sense? Verse 3, and he humbled you, and he let you hunger, and he fed you with manna. God on purpose will allow you to lack so you can see a need for him, which you did not know manner, do something special for you, work a miracle that you've not seen. Many times the only way God can show you his power is for you not to be self-sufficient. He has to show up. Nor did the girl fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you. And your foot did not swell those 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. Going to put a pause right there. That's God's job. I look now and I listen to ministries and all they're giving is sweet stuff. Sugar rides the teeth. Amen. Salt prefer preserves. But they're just giving them good stuff. You're going to have a big house. You're going to have a fine hot car. But how many are being disciplined? So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. Y'all need to praise the Lord on that. He's bringing you into a good land. And if you've not been there, he's going to do it if you pass the test of the wilderness. There is a wilderness test that we all must pass so that we can be brought into the good land. At the time, I did not understand it. I just thought he was a sadistic God, that he didn't, you know, wanted me to feel bad. And like I tell so many people, as I ask why, he answers. And he says that it pleased me to bruise my son, so why not you? For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks and water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and figs and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, and out of these hills you can dig copper, and you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. So I encourage you to pass your wilderness test. Don't be one that God destroys in the wilderness. Don't be one that he kills during this time because he's doing that too because of the rebellion of his people in the times that we live in. 
And then he goes on, as I close in verse 11, take care lest you forget the Lord, your God, by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up. And you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Even though he was talking to them then, he's talking to us now. Don't forget him. I preached the message a couple of weeks ago, remember the goodness of the Lord. And she's saying it today. Many times when we go through trials and tests, we just get tired. He said, remember the things that I've done for you. It's good to keep a list. It's good to keep a journal. But the devil will mess with your mind. He'll tell you God is not real. They're just making it up. And then now we have the Google where people are just Googling everything. And then they're trying to disprove scripture. And then it's all kinds of stuff that's out there. It's called mind bending. He's bending the minds of Christians where you begin to doubt. Where you begin to say, is there a God? But if you keep a journal of all the things he's done for you, you can go back and you can look. And you can read what he's done. As long as you've been in Christ, the enemy will still cause you to doubt and say, are you sure? Just like he did Eve, are you really sure? Especially when a place where things are not going well, when you're in the wilderness, he will make you doubt. So keep a list. And he says, as I close, and if you forget, let me say that, go back to verse 18. Beware lest you say in your heart, verse 17, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, but it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. And that happens to us too. When we forget, you say, well, it was my mind. I did it, you know, and we don't think you'll think that way, but you can think that way. And he says that you shall remember the Lord your God for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, that he swore to your fathers, and it is this day. And if you forget the Lord, your God, and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly swear you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. When God gets through with you in the wilderness, he will bless you in ways that you don't think you deserve. God has imprinted you with himself so much so during your time in the wilderness that when you think you want to forget about him or you are tempted to go astray, your time spent with God in the wilderness is triggered and you line straight up. You will begin to worship and thank God for the wilderness experience that you thought when you thought that he would kill you, that those experiences, when they triggered, now those are the ones that keep you in the center of his will. Amen. Give the Lord a hand for those short words. <laughs>